Um, I'm Sahara Bas, as Hira mentioned, I'm co-chair for Women in Energy, and I'm currently working as Associate Upstream Officer at the International Finance Corporation. I'll be your moderator for our last panel in this two-day STEM Forward uh, job fair, and we'll be talking about integrating energy in urban planning. Recent trends indicate that more than a million people will be added in our cities every week till 2050, which means that urbanization would reach over 80% of the global population. Cities consume 75% of the world's resources while occupying only 2% of the Earth's surface, which means that they are a dominant cause for carbon release in our environment. Therefore, urban energy planning and urbanization management will be pivotal for creating the right framework conditions for a sustainable energy future. This is a very important topic, and as energy is the backbone of all development, such as mobility of humans and goods, civil infrastructure and buildings, transformation, therefore needs to begin with planning our large cities better. And this intersection will also open up and has already opened up space for innovation and private sector to play a bigger role, as COVID-19 has showed that government's fiscal space is drying up. This uh, panel will talk about all the opportunities that will come up and the skill sets that our young youth should acquire to tap this opportunity. So before um, I start the panel discussion, I would like to invite our keynote speaker, Mr. Khurram Mukhtar from K Electric, which is the largest, um, uh, which is operating in the largest and most complex city in Pakistan, Karachi. And K-Electric is also the only vertically integrated and private utility and a very uh, close partner for women in energy and a sponsor for our STEM Forward job fair. So Khurram, uh, I'll give a quick, uh, quick uh, introduction. And uh, can Khurram be on stage, Hira? Um, Hira, I don't see Khurram anywhere. Apologies for that. I think I got disconnected, but I am. Sorry, Were you no problem. Speakers? No problem. Yeah, I was wondering if Khurram is here, can you bring him on stage and I'll give a quick introduction and then we can have his keynote address. Hi Khurram, mm -hmm. thank you so much for joining us. Hi sir, how are you? Thank you so very much. Sorry, we can't, we can't, there's a, a really strong background noise. Sorry Khurram, I think you need to, sorry, you need to plug in your earphones maybe to the uh, laptop, uh, they might be loose. There's a little bit of, bit of an echo. Uh, Khurram, you're on mute now. Yeah, you're on mute. Is it, is it? Uh, no, actually, there's still some background noise. Can you speak now? Yeah. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but there's still a little bit of background noise. Okay, so let me just check my check my settings. Is it working without uh, the the headphones? Can you hear me now? Yeah, this is better. Okay, wonderful, perfect. Please, so please continue. Yeah, thank you. I'll just quickly give a introduction and then we'll hand it over to you. So Khurram Mukhtar is the head of energy conservation and change management K. Khurram has 17 years of versatile and diversified professional experience, including eight years at K Electric. Having spent seven years at the front end of the distribution business, Khurram is now heading the energy conservation and net metering department. Prior to KE, Khurram spent an exciting four and a half years managing commercial operations for the largest government organization, Pakistan Railways 
as well as leading the sales function of an internationally renowned brand in Dubai for over two years, meeting business goals and achieving revenue targets consistently while also effectively handling teams. So without further ado, I'd ask Khurram to start with his keynote address. Khurram, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Sahar, for leaving the crazy person out of the description. I truly appreciate that. Uh, and I'm also truly grateful to STEM and everyone else who's behind organizing this event for providing me and for that matter, KE, the opportunity to be here and share a few words with this very important set of people. Uh, it's a very important topic and a very, very pertinent one. And uh, hopefully I'll try and do justice within the given amount of time. I won't call it time, I will call it minutes. Uh, and I'll just start with a single line extract from an interactive session held between a set of university students and Elon Musk. Uh, I've, I presume a pretty known guy to all of us. I've, and and uh, for me, uh, an exceptionally brilliant gift to this planet. Uh, he has founded SpaceX, PayPal, Tesla, SolarCity, and many others. So I would quote, he said, what I think is going to most affect the future of humanity and the biggest threat to our problem is sustainable energy. The production and consumption of energy in a sustainable manner. And if we are not going to solve it in this century, we are in deep trouble. This actually became the truth and the world began taking this phenomena seriously. And now we have real life examples of energy becoming sustainable in cities and countries across the globe. In recent years, sustainability has become a key objective of all mega plants. It involves architecture and constructions, event operations and management, uh, as well as a host of new initiatives that stimulates innovation and greater and generates, I believe, social impacts also. Uh, I personally, having worked in two different and very unique professional environments, I can very easily say that the governments have started embedding sustainability into the long term plans. Private sector is still perhaps the leading uh, is the one leading the way forward. And for me, being part of such an environment has really helped in bringing about the right change with respect to becoming the first utility company to embark upon, uh, embark upon an exciting journey leading towards a more greener and more sustainable future for our, for our city largely and for the country also and for the uh, citizens of the city. We recognize that the way we produce, consume and share energy is fundamentally changing and uh, we are working uh, day and night towards making the city a smart one hopefully uh, in the very near future inshallah we all know uh, it as a fact that cities consume more than 75 percent of the natural resources available globally uh, united nations environment program we also know that it, it estimates, estimates that the material consumption related to cities will augment to approximately 90 billion tons by 2050 as compared to last prob probably it was done in 2010 i believe where it was 40 billion tons and some of these resources are primarily energy raw materials fossil fuels and food etc and uh, when we talk about uh, resource efficiency then it, this model becomes directly and indirectly related to energy and energy efficiency as well. While the prime, I, I, I see it like the primary responsibility still may fall on government and authorities to plan for the future development of this and other cities in this country. This is something still to be owned by the private sector professionals and especially most importantly, the future generation currently into their academic careers across the city and country. Uh, I've since having a very very short short time, uh, there I can just touch upon few businesses and few areas where private entities can invest that can support the concept of smart and sustainable and greener cities in future. Uh, starting would be renewable sources of electricity generation, some um, smart data collection services such as CARTA commissioning, green building commissioning, and consultancy services. Green financing is something that is. Uh, now becoming a big thing and uh, there is a lot of support from the government also 
and we have uh, an SRO probably a, a, a government intervention where on a very low market rate uh, people and entities and individuals can go for solar financing and green financing for their renewables. Uh, energy management services or consultancy providers, this is one area uh, we need to look at and we need to start investing in as, as private entities, private business owners. Um, for us, though the journey is a long one and it's, it's probably uh, going to take years and years and decades to probably just just enter into that uh, that that environment. However, KE is KE being the only private entity among all discos in Pakistan has crossed several milestones in making Karachi, especially, uh, won't say a smart one, but. The direction is there, and the milestones. I would I would like to mention a few of those here. The smart grid system. Uh, we have a network of more than fifty thousand smart meters in the city, which enables K to have an efficient way to monitor energy being consumed within its network. Uh, this smart grid system supports the concept of IoT, that is Internet of Things, which is integral to smart city development. Uh, smart grids also helps avoid uh, billing issues, billing anomalies, and also gives good insight in consumption and the pilferage patterns of various areas in consumer sets, uh, which uh, directly enables KE to provide high quality, high end customer services to, to, to its consumer right at their doorstep. Uh, we are now moving into trials with two way AMI infrastructure, which is advanced metering infrastructure, so that we can have real time visibility over technical and commercial losses and also to monitor and improve network health parameters. This technology is also helping us in responding more quickly to faults and power outages within the city. And uh, additional data collection require, uh, techniques like GIS mapping of the entire infra infra electrical infrastructure, which we are already probably 70% through, and the rest of it is planned in, the, in, in this current fiscal year and part of the next fiscal year. And the entire electrical infrastructure will be there on GIS, enabling and giving us, empowering us in advanced level preventive and system growth planning, which has never been done before and perhaps <coughs> we would be the most utility uh, in doing so. And that also enabling us to providing a good ground level view of how consumers consume power within the city in different areas and different localities. We are also, not heading, but probably in the top tier of how net metering has advanced into the country. Uh, this started in 2016 and 17. Uh, it was a federal initiative and a directive, but how AK has been very supportive. And uh, in the last two years only, uh, we have added almost 25 megawatts of solar into our grid. And the cases are like somewhere around 1,500 or 1,600 consumers. This includes both residential, commercial, and industrial consumers. Uh, besides this, uh, perhaps one of the bigger initiatives uh, are the Go Green ones, where, where KE is involved and leading, starting with, we have ensured that almost all of our generating plants and other uh, premises are ISO 50001 certified. Uh, we have endorsed and we have been very vocal on the use of energy efficient lighting, and we have ensured that this is implemented across all KE sites. Uh, just not keeping it within the company, we have a Sahulat program. It is a well-known program wherein we are collaborating with major manufacturing companies <laughs> who, are, who are involved in manufacturing efficient products such as Phoenix, Osaka, Kenwood, and many more for marketing and distribution of low-cost energy efficient products into within, within the underprivileged, I would say, areas of, of the city. Our head office, it has been completely shifted towards to solar. There is a 300 kilowatt uh, working uh, PV system, solar system. We are also increasing our operational dependency on renewables by installing almost almost 300 kilowatt solar in the next few months. This is within K Electric and within our uh, main heart, heart, heart core operational uh, premises. Okay, and just to add to this, uh, uh, there was there was a big achievement. We 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 understand that this the the green and sustainable future. It's not not just only our responsibility, but it's also lies upon those who are now being educated and they are in the year in their in their 
academic careers we reached out to one of the very very renowned and very prestigious uh, school where we had a three month long specially designed module on how the uh, architecture students are are going to embed the sustainable building design in their future models and this was appreciated and this is now a continuous program and we'll be we are now with the same school and with other 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 institutions educational institutions we are reaching out and we are giving the students and the faculty there the the the, the knowledge and the and the understanding of how important it is for our city and our cities here okay uh, lastly as far as our uh, uh, internal initiatives are concerned um, this is a very uh, real this is a reality of life that even if you can show something that works on the paper and the calculations are also very clear but until you have the physical product or the object it doesn't really sink in for the people so in the in this world we need to have some working prototypes if you have an actual working demonstration or article uh, even if it is in its primitive form that's much more effective to convince convince people and show what's what's there what we are talking about with with this in mind uh, we are very proudly uh, recognizing the fact and we are uh, very very happy to say that the first fully green sustainable commercial building in the heart of this city is going to be inaugurated next month putting on displays key commitment towards this change and paving the way for us and the utility fraternity at large in the country to rise above and present themselves as leaders for such initiatives uh, i would also uh, i would i won't say lastly but uh, i would also like to touch upon few of the critical skills needed by the upcoming professionals especially those who have interest to add value to the cause of integrating efficient uh, energy in urban planning first of many would be a good and thorough knowledge of energy generation both conventional and alternate renewables knowledge of how energy works and what losses are during transmission and distribution what are the essential and the latest automation protocols and techniques these are all which our students our our our, our people should know and should have a decent grip on before entering into the industry world best practices in developing energy efficient technologies and common things such as like blowers compressors boilers and etc and these this this sort of equipment uh, our designs uh, a, a very in depth knowledge of how green buildings work what is the optimal designs for different equipment this is a must for everyone who's uh, thinking of entering into the industry for 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 with a view of with a commitment of adding value to this chain uh, a flight knowledge and uh, a, i would say uh, an understanding of how the green financing model or the structure works would definitely help professionals from this side to facilitate consumers and entities entering into this kind of an environment and uh, lastly environmental engineering and urban sociology it is very very important there are tons of other things other than energy which is like waste management waste water management water conservation conservation of fauna flora air quality economic vitality and diversity things like this uh, will 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 definitely help uh, the environment plus jobs related to environment are now appearing rapidly to align corporations vision with sustainability as an objective so it is there and going to stay and it is absolutely uh, will will provide the students and the people entering an edge to land on 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 a better 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 area better environment and so that they can add value to whatever the industry is trying to do ke also as well has an environmental program system club with a comprehensive compliance mechanism uh, i would i would i would say that Uh, i would end this with a real life example uh, if if we have all seen the cutting edge innovations in auto automotive industry i would refer to the electric vehicle industry the biggest challenge here was not to manufacture electric vehicles ton of manufacturers were already doing so but the challenge was to bring about the perceptual change which uh, was that the world was seeing these electric vehicles as slow as ugly as low ranged and we saw that fear of 
few of the people who were there in this industry took up this as a challenge in the same world managed to turn this perception on its head and now we all are very openly accepting this fact that the electric vehicles are now considered as real fast very attractive and highly long range so things are there and principles are there only to be changed if there is a will and if there is the right understanding of what needs to be changed and when is when it is to be changed students i believe are the magicians of this century with nothing holding back holding them back as imagination can be the only limiting factor i would urge each and every of one of them to go out there create some magic uh, uh, lastly at the end i would thank again uh, everyone sahar and the entire organization team organization team of this this stem fair thank you once again thank you so much khurram thanks a lot for your uh, informative keynote and um, uh, for telling us all about what k electric is doing thank you so much and uh, thanks a lot for your time so i will move on to our panel discussion now and quickly introduce our um, equally distinguished uh, group of people who will be joining us for this discussion today so we have with us stefan sanger uh, from the world wind, uh, wind energy association Uh, Stefan is the Sec uh, Secretary General of the World Wind Energy Association and was instrumental in the foundation of the uh, of WWEA in 2001 and has been managing the association since then. And under his direction, WWEA has become the voice of the wind sector worldwide with 600 members representing indirectly 50,000 members in more than 100 countries. He's one of the initiators of the International Renewable Energy Alliance. and has consulted for governments as well as international organization he is a member of the international steering committee of ren21 a co initiator and executive committee member of the global go 100 renewables campaign and a member of the innovation network of the japan renewable energy foundation so welcome stefan next Thank with you. us is um, victoria delman Uh, Ms. Victoria is uh, the Asia Pacific Regional Lead for Upstream and Principal Investment Officer in the Infrastructure and Natural Resources Department at the IFC. Victoria brings over 25 years of experience in infrastructure finance, M&A, and structuring of infrastructure projects, with extensive private sector experience in water and wastewater, transport, and solid waste sectors that span. all uh, throughout the world including africa eka mena and south and east asia pacific she worked at uh, fresh fields brockhouse trenger uh, deringer um law in london um paris and frankfurt for 7 years and as in house international counsel at the utility company veolia environment for 7 years and then the world bank for over 14 years victoria holds an ma in law from oxford university and is a solicitor qualified to practice in england and wales really happy to have you online victoria but i don't see you oh hira all right so the, our next speaker is uh sofia shakil Sofia Shakil is the serves as the Asia Foundation's country representative in Pakistan with additional regional program responsibilities. An experienced policy economist, Sofia brings nearly 25 years of experience in the development sector with a focus on human development, public sector policy and governance reform. She has held several positions with the World Bank, Asian Development Bank and international NGOs and brings to this role her extensive knowledge of and passion for asia's economic and social development last but not the least we have with us navin sohail khan navin sohail khan is a human resource professional at with 7 year about more than 7 years of experience in multiple hr roles with specific focus on hr topics compensation and benefits training and development employee well being and engagement and she is currently the hr service specialist at hitachi abb power grids pakistan navin has a masters degree in strategic human resource management from the university in wollongong uae and a bachelor's degree in economics and social sciences from the lahore university of management sciences happy to have you both sofia and navin and to uh, 
Thank you. Um, while we, uh, uh, while Vicky, uh, Victoria joins us, maybe we can start the discussion with you, Stefan. And um, I'd like to pose the first question to you, which is, how do you see um, the inter what opportunities and areas do you see the intersection of energy and urban planning has opened up globally? And what skill sets might be required to tap these opportunities? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's a great pleasure being with you. I mean, this is a so important topic. And I got this uh, question you sent me in advance and it's just uh, very difficult to give you a, a, a short answer because the answer is so broad. Let me say that also my, my main focus is on wind energy. I've been working on renewable energy in general since for more than 20 years now. My first conference was in 1998 about European uh, conference on solar energy and urban planning and architecture. And I think that already highlighted more than 20 years ago all the opportunities that we will see more than 20 years ago. And I, it's very amazing to see that uh, a, a large part of what was discussed at that time has not yet been implemented. So of the of the the options that we have, uh, fundamentally, let me say that what we're what we're seeing now is a huge transformation of our global energy supply, which has big impact on cities. So we are about to transform the energy supply from centralized uh, fossil, little bit nuclear resources to renewable energy sources, which are available everywhere, which totally changes also the structure of cities. Of course, cities so far are mainly importing. They also become now powerhouses. So they will probably uh, generate a lot of the energy that they need locally. Not all of it, but they will do that a lot, which they will do in very different manners and, and ways. So some of it will also come, of course, from, from around. But you see this trend. And taking my, my hometown, where I'm now in Bonn, where the UN Climate Secretary is based, there was a calculation made uh, recently, and that's just a very simple example, that 50% of the power could come from the rooftops of the houses. Just imagine, at the moment, I think it's like 2% of the, of the roofs are only using solar PV. So just covering all the, all the roofs, and that means also all the storage systems, etc., that will lead to such a huge economic I mean, activity and that is just now we talk about power and one part of the power. We will need a completely different set of uh, mindset of how we do urban planning. So I don't think we will need maybe more architects, but we need different architects. We need better architects. Architects who think again about the um, environment and how to use, for example, the solar energy that comes from the sky. And that already requires that the people who are now studying architecture that they learn that at the university it's it's a it's a very big range we talk about <clears throat> urban planning how you plan houses again the people that have been doing this for the last couple of decades they've been thinking especially in in the western uh, of course world but also you see this in many like i think karachi as well you focus a lot on this on big roads for cars I think cars will play a minor role. Of course, I agree that electric mobility will be important, but it will be this individual uh, mobility will play a, a, a smaller role in the future. So also here in the area of how we organize our transportation, we will need less roads. We will need more roads for bicycles, pedestrians, for public transportation. So it is a, a very, very, very broad variety of jobs the solar installers, you will need, these are non-academic jobs, of course. You, we need better architects. We need better uh, people who can do the town planning that is necessary. Of course, when we talk about uh, wind energy, for example, the large wind turbines will probably be outside the cities. But there might also be some small wind turbines. And again, for that, you will need a, a range of engineers who can design those turbines, who can who know, and that's very important. You don't, don't just put it on a rooftop. Who, who can do like the wind measurement and, and then put them at the right place. And then those people who do it. So it, I, I, it's impossible to say um, these and these and these jobs. It's very broad. Just keep in mind the new paradigm is locally, I mean, harvesting local energy primarily, the solar energy primarily. Then it depends, of course, on the cities. Again, here where I'm living, 
geothermal energy plays a big role. I think that will also be important for heating, of course, here, maybe in the part of the world where you are, maybe cooling is more relevant. But again, here, you can use that kind of um, um, also geothermal for cooling instead of heating. It's uh, really, we have to change very basically, and it's important, and I'm very happy that you, as the more young generation, you think about that um, and start talking also to your people around you. So it's actually at the end up to you also to identify what exactly are the needs and uh, to define what are the requirements and also say, yeah, this is what we need to do. And this is where we develop our skills because it's also for our future. I think that's also important. It's mainly for your future. So that let me say this as an introduction, not as a uh, kind of direct one-to-one -one answer, but just to describe a bit more the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for highlighting that and, and also highlighting that it's very broad and the skills required would obviously evolve. And uh, and it's not just one active stakeholder play, there's several stakeholders. And my next question on that would be to you, Victoria, what role do you see IFC playing in this uh, area, in this new intersection of energy and urban planning? And what kind of opportunities have uh, organizations like IFC tapped into already? Yeah, you're on mute. Here we are. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Great. OK, thank you very much. Um, so thanks very much for inviting me to this panel. Um, IFC, uh, the International Finance Corporation, is part of the World Bank Group and is focused on supporting um, and opening up markets um, in developing countries where we work, uh, in particular uh, working with private sector clients uh, and also through uh, our World Bank colleagues with governments uh, to really create markets and open up opportunities. And I see significant opportunities in the urban sector and, and this question as to really how we can leapfrog technologies in a lot of the countries that we're working in. And there are a number of areas uh, where we are trying to uh, look at what's going on elsewhere in the world so we can leverage our global presence to uh, develop, to, to draw from experience both in developed and developing countries to come up with business models in new areas. So, and one of the areas that we're looking at uh, is uh, electric vehicles and thinking through how cities will actually be able to cope with the increased amount of uh, need for uh, uh, energy in those specific places, whether it's charging stations, how the utilities are going to be able to provide that, as well as looking at the whole supply chain and uh, at demand. And what, it, what is it going to be? What's it going to take to kickstart uh, electric vehicle take up in a lot of the countries that we're working in? Another example is looking uh, and again very crucial for cities how we make sure that we get power to the uh, end users in the last mile how do we ensure that it is uh, more more uh, sustainable and that it is more consistent so working with the private sector in a number of places for example in pakistan we're looking at distributed generation and how we can work with uh, industrial and commercial customers to really support them and help them be able to have the uh, reliable power that they need. Um, and there are many other areas that we're looking at. We're looking at uh, cooling and what, again, what business models have worked elsewhere in the world and what, what can we do to really um, help uh, jumpstart some of the investments into those, whether that comes through municipal finance or it comes through the private sector. Uh, so there are a number of areas uh, that we're really trying to to develop best practice and uh, we're doing quite a lot of that in Pakistan as well as elsewhere in South Asia to really uh, use not just use experience from elsewhere but also to have uh, these markets as the market leaders for the rest of the world. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Victoria, for highlighting. Maybe if you could quickly also briefly touch on uh, the skill set maybe that IFC as an organization looks at uh, when hiring people in these in energy and intersection of uh, IFC platforms such as the cities platform uh, that uh, the organization's working on. Thank you. So I think uh, very similar to uh, the lead speaker. So we, we are, um, it's very important that we have people with different backgrounds um, from urban planning right through to um, energy, particularly experience in renewable energies and different uh, technologies there, but also in terms of understanding finance and different financing mechanisms. Mm -hmm. uh, IFC works a lot in the, um, the medium and, and small, um, small and medium enterprise uh, area as well. So really being able to understand how you can work with entrepreneurs and having that background um, and even at the small level, so particularly in innovation, we have colleagues who work um, in venture capital and really trying to create uh, seed opportunities for to leverage technologies. So that the whole uh, gambit of uh, financing expertise as well. And we also have colleagues who are working on environment and safeguards issues, which are very important, being able to bring up the standards on environmental issues is something that's fundamental to the World Bank group. And so people with uh, backgrounds in social science and in environment. Um, so really a whole range of uh, expertise uh, is really relevant. And we are pushing a lot into um, also ensuring that we try and achieve gender parity in a lot of the projects that, that we're working on. Um, we've seen over and over again the, the really impressive stats that you get from um, entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs who are leading companies. And so we're really trying to encourage that um, in the region. Um, and we're working also to, to see if we can achieve parity in terms of board or at least increase board representation with, with women, um, right through to looking at mechanisms for bringing uh, more and more women into uh, the sorts of sectors uh, in education, so through education. So um, to see more female engineers um, and then also really trying to ensure that there is inclusion um, of women in, in all consultations that are had, particularly in relation to infrastructure projects. And so um, there's a whole range of needs to be able to achieve all of that um, in terms of the skill sets that we're looking for. Great. Thank you. And you've highlighted some very important areas that we can uh, that we look at for engaging young youth like fields, but also how maybe we can in increase uh, women participation. So bringing the conversation from global to local, my next question is to uh, Sophia. And uh, given Asia's foundation work and your experience, like how do you see Pakistan faring in this field that is improving urban processes uh, to create smarter, cleaner, greener cities? Well, let me first start by saying, well, um, thank you to the, you know, the, um, the keynote speaker and to the other panelists for bringing up some, I think, very pertinent points. I want to first say that, you know, when we talk about what's happening in Pakistan, let's look at like regionally and, and globally, what are some aspirations that we can, you know, work towards? And, you know, when we talk about livable um, and inclusive cities, what do we really mean by that? And what does that, you know, and how is that going to pan out for Pakistan? When we talk about livable cities or inclusive cities, um, we're talking about putting people at the forefront and getting people, cities to provide essential services to people, but getting their inputs into it. Across Asia, and this is something that Pakistan is going to have to also, you know, be confronted with, it's, which is already happening, is that there's um, all the way from demographic shifts, which are changing the, the kind of makeup of the cities and then in ergo the services that need to be provided. But then also um, we're seeing a lot of urban rural integration taking place with diversifying value chains. How, how are cities going to cater to that? And so what are the kinds of um, skills, what are the kind of frameworks one needs to keep in mind is that to support you know, further inclusive cities development and um, making cities uh, more green. Um, you know, whether you're talking about 
introducing, I mean, we've heard all about the technologies in terms of, you know, sustainable transport and, um, and other services, but it's also about, you know, creating um, green spaces, cre creating um, spaces for, for leisure, which are really critical as demographics also change. And we've seen that a lot in China, you know, where um, with aging populations, you not only need more leisure space, but you also need to ensure that from all the way from, you know, from home to the end, it is, it's, it's a completely inclusive infrastructure. Now, what kind of skills do you need for that? You need to bring together skills, not only on the technical side, but also on the planning, also in terms of being able to mobilize, raise awareness amongst the users and have them participate in the planning. And I think Victoria was also saying this, that, you know, a lot of the social science skills as, uh, as well as, you know, on the environment, of course, that's in addition to the technical. Now, one more point that I did want to make that I think for Pakistan is really relevant. Um, if you just take a look at what happened in Karachi during the recent floods, um, here you're talking about municipal services that came to a standstill were completely, you know, whether it's floods and, and elsewhere across Asia in particular, we've seen the pandemic has completely upended a lot of what we know about basic essential services and what is that ultimately very important. What we saw in Karachi happen in the floods was that um, the, the, the one opportunity that I saw, of course, of course we saw a breakdown of um, a, a range of, you know, basically a governance problem. But what we also saw was that we need to get more private sector solutions and innovations that are integrated into municipal and public services. And that's where I think there's a huge skill set. I know IFC plays a strong role in supporting, um, you know, private investors, but we also need to build capacity of the public sector. We need to create that space. We need to put the people back in the um, in in the framework of um, partnerships between public and private sector, and 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 ensure that you know the needs of um, all, uh, you know, urban dwellers, all the types of citizens are really catered for. So I'm going to stop there because I've, I've given a little bit of an overview of about the kind of um, you know conditions, environments, and and partnerships that you need in order to create more livable and ultimately sustainable cities. Um, but that really putting people and partnerships at the center is going to help achieve that. Thank you, uh, Sophia. And uh, like you highlighted, I think like um, Karachi of all the cities in in Pakistan is in desperate need of some major urban planning, especially like creating that into a smart city with a huge population and not very well planned city. Um, it's actually um, uh, like welcoming a lot of disasters and that the implications it has for people there is it, are very, very dangerous. And, um, uh, and I completely understand when you highlight the, the need for creating inclusive cities, which means that the younger youth, but also women need to be part of the decision making mm -hmm. when we talk about inclusion. So before we delve more in that, I would quickly like to bring in uh, Sophia as we are, as this panel is part of uh, Job Fair. And I would like to get her view and Hitachi's uh, view on how they foresee this potential market in Pakistan. What are the areas that uh, Hitachi is tapping when it comes to looking at futuristic technologies, energy, and planning smarter cities? And what skill sets do they look uh, for when hiring young, young professionals? Naveen, over to you. Thank you, Seher. Um, so as Seher uh, emphasized that Pakistan actually has the highest rate of urbanization in South Asia. Uh, so what we see is that this increased urbanization actually puts a lot of pressure on your energy systems. And then it creates this dire need to create what we call a sustainable energy future. Uh, this joint venture that is between Hitachi and ABB Power Grids has actually emerged during this COVID pandemic. Both the companies are global technology leaders and have a combined experience of almost 250 years uh, in creating a sustainable energy future. In Pakistan, Hitachi ABB Power Grids is serving customers in all verticals, uh, including our key customers such as NTDC, Vapta, K Electric. We are helping them and providing them intelligent, innovative solutions which can actually help create a sustainable energy future. 
what we've seen in pakistan is that the uh, this this mission to create a sustainable energy future actually entails three very important things firstly uh, for any society to be sustainable and for to create a sustainable energy future you really need a power system that is strong it's modern and it's resilient uh, in pakistan we see that our national grid system the transmission system is very complex and that there is a need uh, to adopt modern technologies the latest state of art technologies such as uh, modern scada systems automation substations and even digital systems so we are working very closely with our local customers to create grids that are smarter that are greener and they, that are more sustainable secondly uh, one of the key factors in moving towards a sustainable energy future is that we make pakistan energy independent uh, Hitachi ABB Power Grids is really working towards that. For example, we are providing the latest HVDC technology to our CASA project. It's a $330 million project that is supported by the World Bank, and it's going to move sulfurous hydroelectricity from the Central Asia, such as Tajikistan, to Pakistan. So we're really going to help Pakistan become energy independent. Thirdly, and most importantly, it's very important that Pakistan is able to use renewable sources of energy. So locally, Hitachi ABB uh, power grids is uh, enabling uh, uh, power uh, in uh, solar projects and wind projects all over Pakistan, particularly in the Sindh region. Uh, we are excited and we're proud to say that we're actually at the forefront of helping Pakistan harness renewable sources of energy. So, uh, I mean, uh, we are working locally to try and create a sustainable energy future for Pakistan. Now, the second question, um, Seher, that you also talked about is how can we engage young professionals in this thing? Being in HR, what I have noticed is that individuals, they no longer want to just have a job. They actually want to work for a company that has a good purpose, that has a strong purpose to do good in the world. So that's something that we resonate with. We want to help societies become sustainable. We want to create smart cities. So we really resonate with the new generation. However, in the new generation, we see that in Pakistan, we have highly ta talented individuals. But what we really look for is individuals who are driven because we've seen that individuals who are driven, who are motivated, they are more uh, likely to come up with holistic solutions and tackle big problems. So that's really important. In Pakistan, the young generation is super talented, but something that we can really focus on, and I would also like request the academia to focus on is the communication skills, the problem solving skills, the soft skills. Because at the end of the day, when uh, when individuals join companies like Hitachi and ABB, we do train them with the product expertise and all the technical knowledge that they would need. But at the end of the day, the communication skills are, is that what matters? Because at the end of the day, it's all about working with your customers, understanding their needs and actually delivering high service and utilizing these uh, innovative technologies and actually helping them make use of that. So it's really important mm -hmm. that individuals have those communications and problem solving skills and they're really super driven to actually serve customers and could help create, you know, sustainable society. So that's the most important thing, yes. Thanks a lot, Naveen, for highlighting all the important uh, skills that are required. Over these two days uh, during the job fair, we've been talking about skills required and also about gender parity. And I was thinking when I was maybe structure, trying to structure this panel, is that why is gender parity important? And actually, at uh, IFC, we had this very interesting presentation by our gender team that asked us some questions, and quite a few of us were surprised at answers. So did you know that NASA suits, like space suits, are not gender neutral? They're made for men and can be dangerous for women. Do you know that PPE suits are also not gender neutral? Mm -hmm. And there's research that also shows that public transit is used more by women and in a different way. Yet when we're planning public transit and all these other things, we're not keeping gender in mind. And that is exactly why we need women right up there making the decisions. And like Sophia, you mentioned, creating cities that are more inclusive. Because if you don't have women, it's not just um, it's not just a feel good tick mark or a, a donor requirement to have X number of women on your teams or your panels or your um, uh, workforce. It's essential because we're a significant percentage of the population. And if we're not planning, keeping our own safety in mind, others will not. 
So keeping that in mind, I would want to ask all of you to maybe give me two as concrete as possible steps that we can take to improve women participation in all these fields. I know this is a difficult question. I've put all of you on spot, but if you can give me two, like I've tried to narrow it down to like a number so that it's more specific and maybe we can start with you, Stefan. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, oh dear, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's that's a, a, a tough one. I, I'd prefer not to be the first to answer this. I mean, I just can fully agree what you say, and it's very, it's for me really uh, great to be here with you and the only <laughs> man. I do appreciate that as well. I mean, uh, we we had just two days ago, and then Namira spoke there as well. We had a a uh, also video conference uh, about women in community energy, and one of the leaders of the persons behind Greta was there, um, who developed that Fridays for Future movement. And you see that uh, what, what we're trying to understand at the moment is that women obviously have a different mindset and they, they are, uh, less, uh, it's less about competition. So what we need, this cultural change for more sustainability um, requires uh, less kind of understanding yourself as competing, but collaboration and communicating. Um, I think uh, I'm a man, so it's a bit difficult for me to answer, but I'm trying to get a more abstract uh, understanding of this. And this is how far I've come so far. The climate movement is absolutely dominated by women around the world. And it's so important. I mean, without you women taking the lead on this, we're we're lost. Um, so I think that is probably the way. Uh, again, it's an abstract answer, but I'm also not in Pakistan, of course. Uh, but we we have to shift that uh -huh. around. and and more, as I said, more focus on, and you women, you have the strengths, make use of it. And to the man, I just can say, please understand we have, we have more need to collaborate and communicate and less to compete. I hope that that answers a little bit your question in, in my limited role, what I can contribute yeah. to. Maybe, no, maybe Thank I you can, so much. can I, maybe I yeah, can supplement yeah, I, and maybe definitely. I think to help articulate that, what, I think you, you're you absolutely correct. And I think there are two ways to do that. One is to ensure that women are included in right at the beginning at the planning stage. So when you're doing an assessment to, to do a, you know, a gender analysis, social inclusion analysis, for, uh, for any kind of in, in, you know investment, you really need to make sure that you're getting the right kind of um, consultations to inform all kinds of program design. On the other hand, what Naveen was saying was also very true. It's the soft skills. How do you build up that leadership skills in women to be able to voice their, you know, as, as users as well as, as drivers of change? How are they going to voice that? And I think that we need to focus on really strengthening leadership skills in women and we've done, at the Asia Foundation, we've been doing a lot of um, supporting um, STEM hackathons, um, focusing particularly on women and, and ensuring that it's not just the technical skills, but developing those leadership skills is so important. Um, and that comes at, you know, during your education, but also taking on projects outside of your work in the community, giving to the community. And I think that's where we need to be much more supportive and create space for women to play a leadership role. Thanks, Sophia. And I will take the same question to you, Victoria, if you can. And you've briefly touched on what IFC is doing, but maybe if you can give one or two like concrete steps to increase women participation, not just in IFC, but organizations, private sector around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And um, I, I could, this is something that's very close to my heart and I could talk about for hours. So I will try and restrict myself. Um, I'm a lawyer by background and I was quite heavily involved in a in, uh, number of years in uh, the, uh, the whole analysis of, of women engagement in, in legal issues and, and, and justice. So the, um, it's amazing how many countries where uh, even uh, some really you know, basic things, there are limitations on women's ability to enter into the workforce in those sectors, um, particularly in the construction industry, um, but across the board. And, and it's amazing how many countries do have restrictions on what women can and cannot do. Um, so that's something that's sort of aspirational and should certainly be pushed. Um, at the more kind of practical level, I think I alluded to 
the the importance of having consultations, mm -hmm. and I think we've we've highlighted that. Um, other speakers have highlighted that. What I saw, and um, particularly, I, I used to be with the World Bank before joining IFC, um, and was working on a lot of water projects and urban projects, uh, as well as um, peri-urban projects. And that obviously, women in so many of the countries that we work, including in Pakistan, are the primary. Uh, people who are collecting water, who are responsible for ensuring that there's food on, on the tables and the families. And yet it's amazing how often there is no consultation or not adequate consultation of women about um, where, for example, something as, as simple as uh, uh, where a, a common um, standpipe mm -hmm. should be placed. And what we've seen is that um, even if you consult women, but you have them in, in some cultures, if you actually have consultations where men and women are present together, uh, women do not really have a voice because they don't speak up. And so you just need to make sure that you uh -huh. do ta tailor it to the specific culture to get the uh, outputs from the consultation that you really need. Um, and then the other one I wanted to flag, which is again, another practical thing, is just how important it is to be able to ensure that women get access to finance. And this is partly linked to the previous point on, on legal issues but in so many cultures and so many um, places, again, that we work, uh, it's very difficult for women entrepreneurs to, to get financing. Um, it Maybe it's because they don't have, um, they don't own land. Um, and again, that can be linked back to inheritance laws and, and other issues. But also um, just the, the wherewithal to be able to open a bank account or any of these things. In, in most places, it's very difficult. And so we really are pushing at IFC and I know another a number of other organizations as well to really try and work out how to um, open up opportunities for female entrepreneurs who are particularly, you know, pushing into these different areas. Thanks a lot, Victoria, for highlighting all those important points. And I know we're running out of time, so I uh, ask Naveen to share her thoughts on the same question. Yeah. Well, I think that women representation, of course, is very crucial. Uh, in Hitachi ABB, uh, in my company, I would say that, you know, one key step that we are taking and we encourage other companies to do the same is that we are actively recruiting women. Our company actually has this goal to achieve 25% women representation by 2025. So that's really important that you actively recruit women and that they be represented in key, key positions. Like in my company, HR department is led by a woman. In the finance and legal department, that's actually led by a female. And even in technical positions, it's very important that we make sure that we have female representation. And even at high levels, you know, the management team at the management level, we need to actively recruit and push women to these positions of power and even to technical positions. Uh, secondly, in our company, for example, we have a really good structured internship program where we actually ensure that there is female representation and such initial orientation to the company is really important for women because they get an idea they get acquainted with a multicultural setup and what is actually expected of them so it's really important to always push women and make sure that they are well represented by actively recruiting and making sure that they are at those very key positions yes Thanks. Thank you, Naveen, for highlighting um, all the important step Hitachi is taking to increasing women partnership. And like we all discussed, especially when we're talking about urban planning and creating smarter and more inclusive cities, is, is extremely important, not just to understand uh, the role climate change is playing, but also like Stefan mentioned that the climate change campaign is significantly driven by women because they're that impacted uh, minority that in, in all situations, like women are impacted by all the disasters worse than men are. And they're, they're at the bottom of the poverty, um, poverty chain as well. Hence, it's extremely important that women are part of the uh, designing of urban processes and working at this intersection. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. And I'm glad that we're able to manage this uh, discussion within the scheduled time. And thank you so much for your participation. This is very engaging. And we hope to work together more in the future. And thanks a lot thank for joining so us for the STEM Forward uh, job fair. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.